Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So as has already been mentioned, I'm a mathematician, but I'm working on an interdisciplinary area at the moment. So in my team at the University of York, there are bioinformatics people, mathematicians, biophysicists, and we are all coming together to try and understand viruses. And in particular, we want to understand the symmetry of viruses. And that's why I'm here today to talk to you about symmetry and viruses, because by understanding the symmetry of viruses, you have a good start in finding new drugs and new treatments against viruses because the symmetry kind of encode the formation principles of the viruses and when you understand them you're in a good position to come up with new strategies there. So to start off I would like to show you a movie of a so-called bacteriophage which is infecting a bacterium. A phage is something very similar to a virus, only that it is infecting a bacterium as opposed to a human cell or an animal cell or um, a plant. And here what you see coming in is what we call the phage. So the phage particle basically has a head which has this symmetric structure that we are interested in. So you see a little bit of this head here. So this head looks very much like these shapes I've brought here for you today. And this particle at the moment is not infecting um, a, a bacterium, but basically injecting its genome inside of the bacterium. And the genome was transported in this head, what we call the phage head. And that's why we're very interested in the geometry and the structure of this head. And we try to understand how it's forming and how we can interfere with that. And I would like to express my thanks for this movie to uh, Michael Rothman's lab, and in particular to Peter Lyman, who has created the movie. Um, this is one of the leading structure biology labs, and they've done a lot of really important work in that area. So, in order to set the scene, let's first talk about length scales here. And here I'm introducing to you quite a few objects, including a virus here, an artist's impression of a virus. This is a painting we've done for our common room at the York Center for Complex Systems Analysis together with a few colleagues. And as you see here, obviously there's something not quite right about the length scale. The virus is big in the corner. You see the fish and the other objects. So let's have a closer look at where we're really standing with length scales here. So humans in the meter range, me certainly a bit smaller than some others here in the room, um, you can see by eye up to 10 to the minus 4 meter, which is about the size of a hair. So or in this area, everything can be easily seen. Then there comes an area which kind of overlaps slightly with that area where you would use a light microscope to look at the structure. So this would, for instance, include the end, the hair again, up to a bacterion. But if we're talking about the nanoscale, where we place the viruses over here, so the virus is here, um, it is no longer good enough to look with a light microscope. You would look with an electron microscope, so you would basically um, radiate electron beams at the structure as opposed to light beams and investigate the structure in that way. And if we're doing that, um, for, then we basically get a better idea of, of the structure of the virus. But before I'm going there, I want to give you another feeling for how small these structures are. And therefore, I've got a little comparison for you. So the ratio of a medium-sized virion with respect to a flea is the same as a human next to twice the size of the Mount Everest. So we're talking about really small objects here. And so it's not surprising that actually there's an abundance of these objects. We say that phages and viruses together are of the order of 10 to the power 31. This is one with 31 zeros. That's how many of them you would find on Earth, potentially even more. So this, that's the estimate we have. So it's really quite an abundant population. Now, when they're looking with our electron microscope, the data usually are a little bit, what we say, noisy. So they're not quite clear. So you see them here on the left-hand side. This is a typical cryo-electron micrograph of viruses. So what we are doing as mathematicians in the first instance would be to use those data and use mathematics to reconstruct from those data. And what we are doing is to take many of these pictures, superimpose them, 
and then reconstruct from that superimposition the structure of the virus. And when you do so, then you see that there are actually very, very different structures. If you zoom in on the outer surface, so here I've got a virus which corresponds to the common cold, so most of us have had contact with that, unfortunately. Me last week, that's why I'm still a little bit flu here. And also, for instance, viruses which cause cervical cancer. This is a virus which is often in the press these days, human papilloma virus. So again, slightly different surface structure um, of this virus here. And there are a lot of viruses out there that we don't know yet. So for instance, here's one which we haven't identified yet. So maybe someone can help and, and find what it is. So um, basically, a little bit of background about viruses. So in a nutshell, a virus wow. consists of a protein container that is protecting the genomic material and is transporting that material into the cell in a similar way as a Trojan horse basically invades uh, its enemies. So what the capsid is doing is basically protecting the genomic material and bringing it into the cell, releases it, and then the genomic material hijacks the cellular mechanism, produces new building blocks of viruses. These building blocks come together to form new viruses, which are then released, for example, by bursting of the cell. Now, what we are particularly interested in today is the surface of these protein containers, or the structure of these protein containers, because these are the Trojan horses we would like to understand a bit better. And so what we're looking at are basically structures like um, this container on the left. And if you would zoom in a little bit more on the surface here, you would see that these are actually clusters from, from individual proteins. So these clusters in this case look a little bit like donuts because I'm still not quite in the resolution I want to be. But if I look more closely into it, then I would see the individual proteins in these little clusters. So for instance, here on the right hand side, you see these different colors. They are just here to help you visualize the different proteins. But in fact, in this case, these would be identical proteins. So we are here to look at viruses today from, with a mathematician's eye, so with a mathematical <coughs> microscope. And by this I mean we would like to abstract from that shape and we would like to understand what are the principles of formation of these objects. And if we do so, we are in a very powerful position to not only understand the mechanisms in which viruses come together, but also we can use similar structures in nanotechnology. For instance, in gene therapy, we can create these containers and use them to transport some cargo. So by understanding this type of mathematics, we have a lot of interesting tools in our hands which we can exploit. Now, in order to do that, we have to talk a little bit about the language of symmetry. This is the language a mathematician uses to describe viruses. So here we have an example. So all of you are familiar with symmetry because, you know, when you look in the mirror, you have the two halves that are imaged onto each other with a mirror plane. So this is what we call a reflection, like shown here on, on the left-hand side. But what we are interested in today are not really the reflections, but actually rotations. So we heard about rotations already in the previous talk and about symmetry breaking. So this is again in the direction of symmetry of rotations. So when I speak about a rotation, I actually visualize an axis, an axis of rotation going through the object and then having a discrete rotation around this axis. For instance, in the upper part, which says two-fold rotation, you can rotate twice by 180 degrees to go back to your original position. So what we mean by symmetry is you operate, you do your operation, and then you're getting back eventually to the original um, shape. Similarly, for three-fold and four-fold symmetry, again, if you imagine you stick an axis through the middle and do the appropriate discrete rotations by mapping one arm of the structure onto another arm, again, you have a symmetry or rotational symmetry, but we say it's of a different order. It's like, in this case, it's an <coughs> order three because you need three of these rotations by two pi over three to get back to your original structure. Same here with the four-fold rotation. Now, 
These symmetries are, in a sense, abstract objects that can be realized in different ways. So, for instance, a two-fold rotation is realized by a playing card. Observe if you put an axis in the middle of the card and you turn around this axis by 180 degrees, then the head of the king, which is down below now, moves up on top and is basically the card looks the same after this operation. This is not the same as a reflection because the head of, this, um, of the king looks in one direction. So if you were to put a symmetry axis either through here or through here, you would not map the structure onto itself the, because the king looks in the wrong direction. If I m move the lower bit up to the upper bit, basically the king would look in the wrong direction. So that's why it's not a reflection, but it is a rotation. And this is very important for us because we are actually looking at rotational symmetries later. Similarly here, so the threefold rotation can also be realized by other objects such as a road sign or the forefront by the lucky clover here. So again, symmetry is an abstract object and there are a lot of ways of realizing that. Now, I'm telling you about symmetries because viruses do have symmetries, but this is now a three-dimensional object, so these are three-dimensional symmetries, but it's exactly the same idea as the two-dimensional symmetries. We're having some axes of symmetry, and if I'm rotating around those axes, I'm reproducing my structure. And in particular, the virus has the same symmetry as this object here, which is what we call an icosahedron in mathematics. So if I put my fingers on the vertices of that structure, so there are 12 vertices, and I rotate about the axis that I'm defining in this way, then this is a so-called 5 fold rotation because I can do 5 increments of 2 pi over 5 and then return back to my structure. And with each such, such sub-rotation, I'm also um, reproducing the structure. Now, similarly, there are two more other rotational symmetries. There is a threefold rotation, which corresponds to an axis that goes through the center of the triangles. Now, there are 20 triangles, so I have 10 such axes here. And again, if I rotate about them by 2 pi over 3, I'm reproducing the structure. Now, similarly, there are 30 edges. So I have 15 axes going through the centers of the edges. And again, a rotation by 180 degrees is moving the structure onto itself. So these rotational symmetries are, if you want, characteristic of this object, and very much so of the virus, because as we see, for instance, in this example here on the left-hand side, this viral capsis has a similar structure as this icosahedron. I should warn you, though, that not all viruses have the shape of the icosahedron. Some look more spherical than that, but still they have the same symmetry axis, which is why we say they have the same symmetry. Now, I would like to invite you to play with me a little bit football, and there are footballs on both sides which will be distributed now through the audience. So I hope if you can just hand them in, in all directions, maybe throw them quickly so that people can explore symmetries hands-on with me. So it's probably not a football for everyone, but there should be quite a few, so try to share them a little bit. <laughs> people got one or at least can share one. So let's be a little bit more hands-on now. <laughs> let's invite everyone to explore a rotation. So what I want to show you with this example is that we can combine rotations to obtain other rotations. This is important because in this way, actually, as a mathematician, I don't need to know all of those rotations. I only need to know a subset that I can combine in order to obtain all the other rotations in, that my object has. So in order to do so, I want to show you how we do that, this combination of rotations. So let's play together. We have one of those footballs in our hands and point on one of the corners of a pentagon. This is our starting position. And now we're using a two-fold rotation. So here where you see the two on one of the edges, I imagine that an axis is going through that edge. So you'd take the edge, which is adjacent to the 
corner on which your finger is now pointing, place an imaginary axis that goes through this edge and the center of the structure and turn around 180 degrees. If you do so, you reproduce this point on the other side of the edge. So basically, with this rotation, you have transported this point, which we started off with, to the other side of the edge, which has the two-fold axis on top. Okay? So once you've got that, mark that point, and then we are applying a second rotation. This is now a rotation about an axis that goes through the center of the original pentagon you started off with. So if you place an axis through the center of the pentagon on which your finger was first, and then rotate anti-clockwise around that axis, you will see that your point is being transported to another pentagon as shown here. So you have basically that point to start off with. You rotated it over here. Now you rotate about the center where the five is. So I keep my, the five fixed. And if I do so, this turns around to that point. So basically by first doing the two-fold rotation and then this five-fold rotation anti-clockwise, I have produced reproduce that point that was originally on the five on a different five, right? So now I could have done a similar thing. Let's erase what we've done, just do a new game. Now let's start again with the same point we had initially, but now instead of using the two-fold rotation we started off with, we are now using the three-fold rotation, and again the axis is indicated here by the number three. So if you place an axis in the middle of a hexagonal face, and precisely that face that is adjacent to the pentagon you started off with, and if you are now rotating clockwise about this axis, you will reproduce your point here. Yeah, so you're going, basically you start with your point, you place your axis, and then you're rotating around it, and you see that the effect is to place your point at the same position. So by doing the operations on the left and by doing the operation on the right, we have actually done the same thing to this original point you've started off with. And that's what we call an identity. So the combination, or we would say the product, of the R2 and R5 rotation is the same thing, has the same effect as the R3. So we've seen now we've got a bunch of objects which are rotations, but we have relations between them. And a mathematical object, which has precisely that property, is what we call a group. So we have elements in that group, and they are subject to relations. And the group is very similar to a group of people, as we see here. So it's, it's a collection of elements, a collection of rotations in this case, and there are relations between these people in the group, these elements in the group. And we've just seen an example of such a relation. And we have names for particular groups, and the group which describes the symmetry of my icosahedron is the icosahedral group, not surprisingly. And a lot of other objects have that symmetry too. A dodecahedron has that symmetry, so a lot of other polyhedra have that symmetry, and I've brought here a little toy which contains, has the same symmetry again. It contains a dodecahedron inside, an icosahedron outside. So all of these structures share the same properties, the same rotational symmetries with their relations. Now, you're surely wondering why I tell you so much about rotational symmetries. And well, I should go and tell you a bit more about viruses and symmetry then. So why are we interested in symmetries here? Well, this is due to the work of Crick and Watson, actually, who discovered early on, already in 1956, that viruses use symmetry to organize their protein containers. So here's an example. For instance, these disks represent the locations of proteins. And in this example, you see that there are 60 such disks. And 60 is the number of elements in the icosahedral group. So if I know the location of precisely one of those disks, and I use the icosahedral group, and doing precisely what you've done with the footballs before, I'm transporting this disk all over the surface, then I obtain all the other disks as well. So basically the information of this surface structure is contained in this symmetry group. Give me one location of one protein 
structure of one protein, I know the others of all the 60 others. So basically, symmetry being used to organize the protein container by viruses. But then there are a lot of viruses of different sizes, and viruses with 60 proteins are the smallest ones we see, but they are much larger ones. And here comes the theory of Casper and Kluge, who observed that actually the symmetry group is not enough anymore to describe all the positions of all those proteins in the larger viruses, but they realized that by making an additional assumption, which they call quasi-equivalence, it is nevertheless possible to pinpoint where the protein should be. And quasi-equivalence, roughly speaking in a nutshell, says proteins are supposed to be in almost equivalent positions. So if I place myself on the, on the place of one of the proteins and I look around this protein, it sees a very similar environment to what the other proteins are seeing. That's what they mean by quasi-equivalence. I can formulate this a bit more mathematically for you, and this is to say um, if I basically introduce what we call a triangulation, so I use little triangles to break up the large triangles of my icosahedron here, then by placing a protein in the corner of each of these little triangles, I introduce a rule which has the effect that actually locally the the environment for each of these proteins looks the same. Locally, they are part of different triangles here. It looks around and sees different triangles. So it's locally similar, but globally it's not. So the symmetry group is blind to the subtlety, but this extra rule gives me a rule to nevertheless pinpoint where the proteins would be. And this is actually more powerful than you would think initially because it has predictive power for viruses. And this is the, the wonderful bit about it. And in order to show you the predictive power, I have to explain to you a little bit more how we can use these triangulations to actually write down all possibilities of organizing viruses according to quasi-equivalence. And in order to do so, basically we start again with our icosahedron, and we wonder how I can triangulate the surface of this icosahedron. Now, I could just go ahead and try to draw little triangles on top of the faces, but then it would be a little bit messy with these edges because you want to allow for triangles going over the edges as well. So therefore, in order to like, make my life more easy, I do what we call a planar representation, a planar embedding. So basically, I take a scissor, and I'm cutting this icosahedron open. So I just want to see the surface of the icosahedron. In order to do so, I will cut along the edges such that at the end of the day, I have one connected surface. So let's see. I need to find a few places to cut. Some more. So, and if I do so, I end up with the surface. So basically, it's the same as the surface of the icosahedron, but now it's in the plane. I can lay it flat on the table, and that's important for us because, actually, we want to understand how we can superimpose this on a hexagonal grid. You will see in a minute that hexagonal grids and triangulations are very similar, uh, that they can be derived from each other, but it's easier for us to think in terms of a hexagonal grid for now. So what are Casper and Kluge doing is to say, okay, in order to determine my triangulation, I will allow the surface to be stretched and rotated about some origin in space. Let's say this point is fixed, and around this point, I allow for rotations, and I also allow the edges to uniformly stretch or shrink. And to do this precisely in such a way that when I superimpose it on my hexagonal grid, then these points, these vertices of my structure are ending up in the middle of these hexagonal faces. And there are a lot of ways to, of doing so. Here I show you just three, but obviously there are many, many more possibilities to do that. Now, if we analyze a little bit more what we've got, um, we put points in the centers of the hexagons and connect neighboring points in order to obtain a triangulation. Now, the first object on top is, has been chosen in such a way that I haven't stretched or rotated much, so it is 
basically the triangle coincides with the face that we had before. But in the next object, you see that the blue triangle, which corresponds to my triangulation that is superimposed on the surface, is actually only a third of the surface of one of these red triangles. And correspondingly here, it's only a fourth. So if I've got a red triangle here, you see that this blue triangle makes up only a fourth of that surface. It's a finer um, tessellation. And now we are folding back. So we are bringing the structure back together to a surface and see what we've produced. And actually, I superimpose for you again this one blue triangle here so that you can see where it would fit when you are closing up. And then we're using the rule that we've seen already before, which is the rule of quasi-equivalence, to place proteins in the corners of these triangles. And if we do so, you see that we are actually marking the locations of clusters of proteins, so of agglomerates of proteins. There are here these five-fold clusters, 12 five-fold clusters on top, which is precisely the structure we've seen with Crick and Watson, 60 proteins throughout, a small virus. But then we see other structures where we have, in addition to these 12 five-fold clusters, for instance, 20 hexagonal clusters or 30 hexagonal clusters or more. And this is to say, this is a mechanism of consistently pointing out all possibilities of introducing further proteins such that the structure is consistent with what we call quasi-equivalence, environments about proteins being similar. So actually the big power, and I, I should stress this really, the predictive power of this theory relies on the fact that actually using just theory, you can predict what viruses should look like, and actually later on people went into the labs and discovered viruses for at least the start of the series, obviously an infinite series, it becomes infinitely large, and you wouldn't see such viruses, but to a large number of triangles in a triangulation, which we call a T number, people have discovered examples in virology. So it is actually a very good concept, which gives us a good understanding of what's going on. The reason why I am pointing this out to you is because there is more interesting mathematics in here. So first of all, I should say that these larger structures are very similar to what we call Buckminster Fuller domes. These are spherical triangulations. And for instance, a herpes virus like this one here would precisely follow the layout of such a Buckminster Fuller dome. But even that is not answering certain questions, and that's why we are coming into the game here, because more mathematics is needed to understand uh, certain questions. For instance, people have discovered that there are certain viruses that have clusters of five proteins throughout. We've just learned, actually, from our principle of quasi-equivalence that usually there are these 12 clusters of five located at these vertices of the structure, and that otherwise we've introduced hexagonal clusters throughout. But here now we're seeing a virus, Eureka, which has only clusters of five. There are 72 clusters of five. So the additional 60 clusters are also clusters of five, and this is just a cartoon showing you this situation. So basically the colors, again, are just encoding symmetry. I'm talking about identical proteins here forming this kind of structure. And this cannot be understood with this mathematics that I've just shown you by cutting open the structure. And I want to go a little bit more into details about how we can tackle such structures as well. Also, we would like to go a step further and not just predict the schematic representation of a capsid, so to say where the proteins are located and what type of clusters you have and how the clusters are distributed. You would like to understand potentially as well, whether you can predict the thickness of your capsid, certain features in the surface of the capsid, or whether you can make predictions on the organization of the genomic material inside of the virus. And again, that requires more mathematics. You have to put something else into the game to get this type of information out. And these are the two questions I would like to address here and show you how we can do that. So the solution is actually rather simple conceptually. You're just extending your group. Your group, again, is, are your rotations, and I represent them by, these, by the people. And what I'm doing is I'm introducing one more member, one more element, but this element is no longer um, a rotation, actually, but 
it is something else. And here's our mad scientist at work putting different elements in his test tube, trying to kind of bring together different objects. And we're starting off by putting the rotations in <coughs> that we've already looked at before. And we're putting one more important ingredient in, and these are translations. So translations are structures that are basically repeating in space, for instance, or in time. So in this case, this is a repetition of this um, motif, musical motif here, which is repeated three times. So I've, if you want to translate this musical motif um, to the side. And this type of operation we want to allow in addition to the symmetries we have already. Now, why is that important? Why do I care about it? Well, because lattices actually are built up in a very similar way if you look at how you can construct them. That's why I would like to give you some intuition on how we deal with lattices and then show you what changes when we are dealing with these other structures. So for instance, here we have this hexagonal grid that we used at the beginning and which, which was actually responsible for the fact that we had these hexagonal clusters coming up in addition to the pentagonal clusters. Now this can be produced via a combination of rotations and translations. In order to show you this, um, let's focus on this structure here, and let's focus on the black hexagon in the middle of that structure. There is one initial black hexagon, and now I'm translating this, I'm moving it in space up to this red hexagon, which is the red layout, and then I use my rotations again. So I stick my symmetry axis through the center of the object and rotate <coughs> in a six-fold rotation about the center. And if I do so, then I'm creating this green structure that you are seeing over there. And if I continue to do so, so I shift again and I rotate again, then I can build up gradually a lattice in that way. Now, what goes wrong when you are speaking about a five-fold symmetric situation, like those extra clusters that we've seen for this papilloma virus type, which, which we couldn't deal with before, is the fact that if you try to do the same thing, you will end up with gaps. You will not be able to tessellate the plane with just pentagons. That's what we call the crystallographic restriction. So a different mathematical approach is necessary here. And we are lucky that some other people already stumbled over that problem. There are materials which we call quasi-crystals. These are alloys, for instance, of aluminum and manganese, but also other alloys, which take on atomic positions that are compatible with such a symmetry, which you call a non-crystallographic symmetry, a five-fold or ten-fold symmetry. So they actually are able to organize themselves with that symmetry and still have long-range order. So it should be possible to describe that mathematically. And actually, already in the 70s, people have thought about it. Uh, Sir Roger Penrose has thought about it and actually came up with the famous Penrose tiling, of which I'm showing you here a patch. This is a tessellation in terms of two shapes, a large rhomb and a small rhomb. And if you use them in a consistent way, you can tessellate the plane, and you can even achieve that it's non-periodic, but still you will have long-range order. So we call it a quasi-lattice. It's almost like a lattice, but not quite because it doesn't have the, those symmetries. Now, what does this have to do with group extension? So let's get back to the group extension we used to get, generate the lattice and do the same thing now with a pentagon instead of the hexagon we had before. So what we're doing now, again, we have a structure that has a rotational symmetry. If I stick an axis through the center of this pentagon, I can move point one and point two by a five-fold rotation and so on. And I can supplement this by a translation, which is visualized in green here on the right. And the key is to use what we call a good translation, a sensible translation to do so. Because if I, for instance, choose my translation in such a way that after translation and rotation, I reproduce certain vertices, um, this vertex, for instance, uh, reproduced is this vertex after rotation. So I've started with the red pentagon, I've moved it to the green one, and then I have rotated about the center of the red pentagon. I have basically found certain points that I repeatedly generated with the same formalism. And this only happens if you choose your translation wisely. 
if you choose the translation in a bad way, you get accumulation points, you get structures that are of no interest. But if you do that in a, in a good way, you can generate structures that look very much like the vertices of a Penrose tiling, for instance. They have shares and properties with them, I should say. Now here I show you a movie which tells you why this is a good structure, so why a translation is a good translation. Here you see examples of translations that work in that sense, which I call good translations. And you see they all have in common that after translation, these corners of my pentagon are coinciding with these lines of symmetry. And if I have a structure coinciding with the line of symmetry and then apply that symmetry, I automatically generate these vertices that are repeated. So basically, it is, uh, if you choose the translation to be compatible, let's say, with your rotational symmetry, you can see that then you have this effect that we've highlighted as important for these lattice-like structures. And a similar thing happens in three dimensions. Suppose we are again taking our red icosahedron, which we've now got flat here, and we're doing the same thing. We try to find translations which are compatible with this rotational symmetry of the structure here. For instance, this translation would be a good one. And now I'm rotating around the center of the red structure only three times. I'm not using all rotational symmetries, only three of them. Then I see what happens is that I have these coinciding points. It is, in this case, chosen such that you again find vertices where the green, the blue, and the purple would coincide. And I highlight this with a yellow triangle. So you see on the midpoints of the edges of the yellow triangle, you see these coinciding points. And actually, if you would continue that process, you would see that you are generating a rescaled icosahedron in this way, which is kind of... Uh, filled partly by these translated shapes. Now, why is this mathematics important for us? I'll show you now what we can do with it in, in applications to viruses. So here again, we've seen we have generated these points. It's by just introducing what I called a good translation, we were able to iteratively, as we say repeatedly, generate these points. So I've used my translation and my rotations after another. And in this way, I have generated these types of point sets. Now, I can do the same thing in three dimensions. And that's what I've done here in order to obtain that set on the left. And how does this encode viruses? Well, like very much like you see in these tilings before, now these are just vertices of tessellations, actually. They help us to reconstruct tessellations that very similar to what the Casper Kluge theory did for the standard viruses, here now describes the layout of the non-standard viruses. So for instance, in this example, what we've done is to identify the tilings within that point set that are such that every populated vertex by proteins is five coordinated and they are uniformly distributed. If you search for the tilings in these point sets that have that property, you find precisely three in these point sets. And these are the ones I'm showing you here. And why is that important? Well, remember that I told you that we have these viruses which have five-fold clusters everywhere. For instance, polyoma virus or papilloma virus. And if I take a polyoma virus and just isolate the capsid proteins and put them in a test tube and let them assemble, I see that there are three types of particles that can assemble. And we call them the small, medium, and large particle. And these are basically reproduced are predicted by these surface lattices. So if we again, like with the same rule, like in Casper Kluge theory, put vertices uh, around the five coordinated uh, points here on these tessellations, then they mark the location of the individual proteins. And you see how they are oriented with respect to each other and where they are located. And this is work with uh, a former PhD student, now postdoc, and another postdoc in the group. And you can use this type of mathematics to predict the relative sizes of these particles. I have to say relative, because obviously it's a mathematical structure that is scaled to biology, so one of those three tilings has to be scaled, but the others are then scaled relative to the original one, so they follow automatically. Only obviously one scaling factor is needed to, to place it on the biology. 
Now, I'll show you a little bit more about the large tiling so you get a feeling for what we can predict. So this would be the large tiling. And according to the rule I pointed out, for instance, around this five-fold vertex, you would put proteins in those corners here. And this is indeed what you see. So here on the right-hand side, you see... Um, and the data for one of those viruses superimposed, and you see that indeed the proteins are filling those corners according to that theory. So this abstract mathematical shape basically picks up the layout of how this virus is organized. But um, more interestingly for us, actually, is the question as to whether we can go a step further and not only predict the layout viruses, but whether we can say something about the extension of the capsid and the organization of the genomic material, because then we're a step further to understanding the formation process. And this we've done in the next step. So what we've done is basically to work out all possibilities of having translations compatible with certain types of icosahedral realizations, I should say, of icosahedral symmetry. So we can realize icosahedral symmetry as an icosahedron, dodecahedron, icosidodec, for instance, and then we can look for compatible translations with these. If we do so, we get a library of point set. So what we are finding is there's only a finite number of such point sets, precisely 41, that you can construct in this way. And this is a powerful tool for us because it is giving us kind of a limitation of what those structures can do. So our conjecture is that there are these 41 structures that are of particular importance for viruses. And let's see uh, in how far this is true. Here again, I use as an example bacteriophage MS2. This the structure you see here can be reproduced by downloading from the protein data bank, for instance, and as I give you the ID for that here, um, these structures and visualize them in certain visualization tools, which we call, for instance, PyMol, but there are others. So you can visualize the structure and rotate it in front of your eye. And we would like to understand whether the points in our library have any meaning for a structure of that type. So for instance, we want to know whether one of those point sets that I'm giving here as an example on the right-hand side can tell you anything about the structure of that virus. So this is joint work with biologists who are actually experts on bacteriophage MS2, so we collaborate with them, and we explore together with them whether this is the case or not. They're experts in, for instance, cryo-electron microscopy, but also other techniques, but that's the, the technique we are mainly using here. So this was worked together with Katerina Toropova, a student, Nia Ransom, and Peter Stockley. So what we did was to ask, okay, first of all, which of the elements in our library is the appropriate mathematical object to describe this virus we're interested in? In order to answer that question, we are looking at the outside of the virus first, and we see which of our point sets, if any at all, I should say, is picking up the characteristic outside feature of the structure, like these protruding loops here in that case. And we can do that, and we can pick one library element that is indeed able to predict or to, to encompass, if you want, um, represent this outside structure. <coughs> now, this outside structure comes packaged and parcel with all the other vertices inside. So once I'm choosing a library element and choose a scaling for it, a fitting of it, to the biological structure, everything else in my mathematical object is totally determined. And that's what's happening here. So I'm superimposing all the inner points on the structure as well, um, which are basically now implied, if you want, by the mathematics. And we are comparing this with data on the inside of the virus. So this virus has RNA inside. We are seeing here the RNA density. People reconstruct the density of RNA. And we want to understand whether or not this has any kind of predictive power here. And if you superimpose, you spookily see that actually these points very nicely pick up the, the fact that we have these two different shells of RNA. They pick up features of those shells and in particular, the inner void in the virus. Because remember, we have scaled to the outside. And once the outside is fixed, the inner vertices are fixed with it. So the inner void and the structure of these shells is totally determined. So it seems that really these 
extended mathematical objects can tell us a lot about the structure of viruses. Now, why are we interested in this structure? Well, because ultimately we would like to understand how these objects are forming. Now, let's get back first to um, the papilloma polymer viruses, which are the five-fold clusters we've looked at before. Here is again the tiling shown. And as you can see, or as we haven't looked at enough before, I should say, there are two types of shapes if you look at the surface structures of these tessellations. Namely, I see these kite shapes here on the right, and I see these romp shapes. And we would like to understand a little bit better what they are actually telling us about the virus. And in fact, they tell us something about how individual proteins bond together. Now, in order to imagine that, just think of a protein for now as a ball of wool, which is basically coiled up and then has an arm that it can extend. There are now two different ways of bonding them together that we see in this virus. One is a bonding between three proteins. So we have here three balls of wool. And they can bond by extending an arm to one partner and receiving an arm from another partner. This is what we call a trimer interaction because there are three of them. Similarly, we can bond only two of them together, which we call a dimer interaction. Two of them hold on to the arm of the other, respectively. This is what is represented actually schematically on these tilings. If there are two proteins on such a surface, then they are forming a dimer interaction. They are bonding with each other. If it is a kite shape, which has three proteins located on it, then this is a trimer interaction. So actually, we get a map via our tiling, which not only tells us where the proteins are located, but also where the bonds are located. And in order to describe assembly, this is the most important ingredient we need. We need the shapes from which it assembles and how they are sticking together. Once we know this, we can basically easily cook up models which tell us the concentrations of intermediates on the way to the final capsid. They can tell us how the virus forms. They give us the opportunity to play with parameters and see how we can interfere with it as, as soon as we kind of have this information. And here again, um, the trimer interactions and the dimer interactions in this particular virus. So we've worked on that virus from several points of view along that line. Also, I should say that there is an interesting geometric hitch here. So there are some viruses, again, bacteriophage MS2, an example for it, where the genomic material is important for the assembly process, where there is an interaction between the genomic material and the capsid proteins which form the container. So this is a very interesting situation where when you look at this uh, container, this capsid here, you see that it is built from two different building blocks. One is a symmetric um, form, which has two proteins in a symmetric state, if you wish. And then the other one is, again, two proteins, but they are asymmetric. They are not looking the same. And the reason why they are asymmetric is that the, gen the genomic material in form of these what we call stem loops is parts of the genomic material just assume a loop, just form a loop like this. This loop is binding in on these dimers of protein and changes its conformation, as we say. So it makes something what is symmetric, asymmetric by binding to it. And this is very important for us because when we want to understand how such a structure works, we actually can use the information we have about the organization of the genomic material. Remember that earlier on when I talked about the 3D symmetries, we were actually interested in pinpointing how the genomic material is organized within the container. Now, this, we put this movie on here. This we see here. So this structure is a representation schematic representation of this container up there. So the individual ROMs which constitute the container are shown as blue ROMs here, and the blue ROMs don't distinguish in this cartoon between the two states, symmetric and asymmetric. And we are superimposing in red the location of the genomic material in the shell which is immediately below the container. And whenever there is a vertex here, 
then this is basically the location of such a stem loop which is binding to the rhomb on top of it and makes it asymmetric. And this is so important in order for the capsid to form at all because it needs symmetric and asymmetric uh, dimers in the right ratio in order to form properly. And this mechanism is helping with it. And for us, it means we can understand the pathways of assembly, i.e., the sequence of different structures on the way to the final capsid by actually understanding how the genomic material, the RNA, can trace this red container. So different ways of walking along this red container without knotting your RNA are different ways of forming this particle. So we can actually use this mathematical trick to tackle a rather complex problem, namely, in which order do the ROMs come in? And this is one of the pathways we are finding. Obviously, there are a few more, but we can rank them against each other in how probable one is with respect to the other. But the key to do so is really to understand the geometry of the shell underneath the protein container and use this information as crucial input in order to work out the potential set of pathways. So again, this is work with, with people in my group here. Now, I hope I could convince you that actually symmetry can help us a lot in understanding viruses. So symmetry for us is really like a microscope. As a mathematician, we are looking at these viruses and we are trying to understand what makes them form. And actually, it opens for us the box of Pandora because by understanding the symmetries, we are now in a position to address quite a few important questions which we are doing at the moment in my group. So for example, I've listed a few virus evolution what is the impact of this limited set of structures that viruses can at all uh, take on on the process of evolution? Could it be that there's convergent evolution and that there is some selective pressure from this limited amount of structures that are available? Geometric implications of mutations. Again, if there is um, a correlation between the structures of the outside and the inside, what can mutations at all do? If mutations change certain things, how does this impact on the overall structure? Which mutations will be stable evolutionary, will be coming up again, which ones wouldn't? So this helps to understand this. And finally, virus assembly. I've given you a little glimpse at that. So we try to understand how these building blocks come together and, and form viruses, and we try to find ways of stopping them from doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you.